Sunday was not our favorite day. It was restricted. We were not allowed to use tools such, such as scissors, needle and thread, sewing machine, hammer, saw or nails, nor to iron. Idleness was never the pure delight <clears throat> that leisure was. We could read, walk over the farm, ride the workhorses. There were, of course, essential daily chores of living that had to be done on Sunday, as well as on weekdays, wood and water to be carried in, dishes to wash, floors to sweep, beds to make, livestock and chickens to be looked after. But without scissors, we could not cut doll clothes or paper. Paper Family, a game invented by my sister Miriam, was one of our favorites. For this, we cut paper dolls and clothes for them out of the clothing pages of a mail order catalog. From the furniture pages, we cut furniture, dish, dishes, household furnishings, and pasted them into wallpaper covered magazines to make big houses for the paper dolls to live in. Our paste was homemade of flour and water. It always either molded on top or soured, developing an evil smell. Work days were harder, but far more enjoyable. My sister Miriam stayed in the house to help mother. My sister Grace cleaned the house and did a great deal of ironing. The younger children worked outside. We set out strawberry plants by countless hundreds. At this time, one crawled half kneeling along the row at the feet of some of one of the hired men who with a flat bladed spade made a straight deep slit in the earth. You set in the plant with its spread out roots and the hired man closed the slit by making another one a couple. of inches farther on and pressing the shovel against it. We also planted apple seedlings and peach seedlings that were later budded. One year my father planted a quarter of a million apple seedlings, and to me this seemed like the largest number to which the human mind could count. We picked raspberries, strawberries, cherries, and wild blackberries gathered and hold walnuts. In the hot July and August afternoons, if there was no canning to do or berries to pick, we often gathered in the guest room upstairs to sew. In the absence of guests, this room was occupied by my sister Miriam. It had a big brass bed and a bird's eye maple dresser in it, and also the sewing machine. Mother and all the girls in the family went up there and sewed. We made school clothes, we mended linens and clothes. There were always great stacks of things to be sewed, things to be made over, new things to cut out. It always seemed to me my turn, for a new dress would never come. My job was to rip up garments that were to be made over. I have ripped out thousands of miles of stitching. We never got everything made, but we did make a great deal, and in those days only coats and men's clothes were bought ready-made. Sometimes our cousins, the Beebs from Ohio, or the Masons from nearer home, came for visits, but there were seldom any children living near enough to be playmates. Playmates were a luxury that went with the six months school term. One summer, Frank Ghost was the hired man living in the cabin above the cherry orchard. He called my brother, Jamesy. He had a daughter, Zelma, about my age. That summer, it was my particular chore to look after the chickens in the hen house in the upper plum orchard, which was across the road from the cherry orchard, and therefore not far from the hired man's cabin. His wife, Holdy, had a parlor organ, which to me seemed much more glamorous than a piano. Zelma could play the organ. 
We met at the hen house and went to the cabin where she could chord an accompaniment for the ballads she sang. I liked Oh Dear Mother, Pen a Rose on Me, wept over, over the sad story of two little children, a boy and a girl, sat by an old church door, but Red Wing was my true favorite. My sister Grace, devoted to cultural life and classical music, objected to my singing these ballads, which she called hoodlum music. My brother James later felt the same way about his sister singing Casey Jones. Once when I came into the house, I heard the piano giving out what sounded happily familiar to me. I rushed in and accused Grace, See now, you won't let me sing Red Wing, but you're playing it. Silently, she pointed to the music in front of her. It was the Happy Farmer. I never cared much for it. In later years, when she became a music teacher, my sister Grace taught folk songs in addition to more formal music. She also taught elementary grades and was a superlative teacher. She had the luminous, rare talent of causing a child to discover the joy of learning for learning's sake. She said, the most exciting gift you can give a child is an idea. She kept on reading, traveling, collecting magazines and books until finally her house became so filled with them that now when I visit her, I feel everybody ought to pitch in as at an old time working bee and get all the books read. She constantly borrows library books, copies out quotations from them, and remembers what she reads. In this, she more than any other of the orchardist children is like him. He should have been a history professor, specializing in French or American history. He should have directed a horticultural experiment station. He should have held political office. He should have traveled and written books about it. His trouble was simply that he had more talent than he could use. He was impatient of detail or tedious commitments but in playing checkers was so deliberate that his opponent gladly threw away kings in a fever to get the game over with. He was tall, straight as a ramrod, as he often said of his mother, intolerant of physical weakness or illness when his leg was broken in an automobile accident and it seemed he might be crippled, he never gave up. He felt that for him to be lame was unthinkable. He constantly practiced walking, and when he was again able to walk, he was slightly shorter than he had been before, but he did not limp, and he was still straight as a ramrod. He was sensitive, proud, insatiably curious about people. He was able to draw conversation out of them and to flatter them years later by quoting them. He had a prodigious memory and prodigious was one of his favorite words he was 10 years older than my mother he loved her dearly and led her a hard life because of the contrast in their essential viewpoints she wanted the conventional general comfortable things the small cozy security he was ambitious wanting always to reach out for a grasp however tentative of some big exciting thing Mother was not a tall woman, she had slim feet and narrow hands and was regularly complimented on her smooth, clear complexion. Tailored suits and dresses were most becoming to her, and she could give a look of elegance to any hat she put on. She liked to dress up in pretty dresses with beads and earrings and perfume. She had pretty legs. I cannot remember a time when she did not have gray in her brown hair that finally became a clear, luminous white. Nor can I remember a time when I did not think she was beautiful. The story the state of Indiana did not buy all of its forest land at one time, and in the beginning did not have, I think, any overall plan for its use, other than the CCC camp, no schedule as a farmer would have 
first looking carefully at a farm before buying it. When the state finally got around to looking for a major source of water, it was unable to locate the tumultuous vein of the big spring which in our childhood never went dry but sometimes had to be cleaned out in its rock-walled five-foot square enclosure, a vein of water as thick as a man's forearm supplied water there for watering all the horses and for all the spraying and for the big washings Miss Atkins did under the beech tree that towered above the spring. She heated water and boiled the white clothes in a galvanized tub over an open fire. She was fat and floppy and amiable and always smelled like soapy water. Usually she ate dinner with us Sometimes she brought her own dinner, and in the afternoon she let us have the cold biscuits spread with white sugar that she had left over. We liked them. She had a son and told my mother that his ambition was to cross the ocean and go to Indianapolis before he was 21. The overflow from the big spring ran across the road and through the tan yard and on past Hill Acres eventually reaching Hacker Creek several miles below. At the end of wash day, Miss Atkins walked home along the Hacker Creek Road. The state had not changed the route of the old Hacker Creek Road that passed between the house and the lower barn. Along the yellow clay banks of that road, we had found rattlestones. The hollow, pale brown geodes dimpled on the outside like a hedge apple, varied in size, but all were light of weight and brittle, easily broken open. Inside they were crystal lined and they and there were a few loose crystals that caused the rattle. Along this road and also on down Happy Hollow Road, the orchardist children found that what we called Indian beads round or oval discs, seldom larger than the salmon bones they resembled, and having a hole in the center, they could be strung for necklaces. Actually, they were the petrified discs of plain lilies that grew there in preglacial times, and were, therefore, even older than the Indian arrowheads and hammers we also found in the fields. Coming home along the Hacker Creek Road, we passed between a peach orchard on the right and a plum orchard on the left. At the far fence line of the plum orchard, the vines of Niagara grapes grew, carelessly twining themselves into the thickety limbs of Lombard and DeSoto plum trees. You could stand on the untrustworthy fence and pick these round, green, greenly white, sweet grapes and eat them as a common thing. As the book of Jeremiah says, but you had to be careful not to attract the attention of the black sow that was often kept in the lot on the other side of the fence. She was a good sow, but cross, especially when she had a new litter of pigs. The orchardist called her clover, but her children who sometimes had been chased by her and had heard her eat peach seeds cracking the hard shells as easily as peanuts between her powerful jaws spitefully called her old white nose and wished she would die when she finally did die painfully in Quincy my brother James and I stood around her murmuring in hypocritical mournfulness, poor old white nose, poor old white nose, until finally our sister Nina cried. There were Concord grapes farther inside the boundaries of the plum orchard, but they were better disciplined. At the front part of that orchard, nearest the house, were the Robinson plums. These were small, bright red, and sour, and made excellent jelly or plum butter, but the glory of them was in the fragrance of their small, whiskery-petaled white bloom. 
blooming, they literally whitened the tree and scented the air, going past them to feed the chickens or to carry slop to old white nose was an adventure in fragrance. The ripened white petals fell like perfumed snow, but the lombards in the upper plum orchard near the hen house were darker green and larger, and when they were the size of large olives, they made better heads for the dolls we created by sticking a forked stick into a green plum and dressing it. These dolls required a little more skill than those with corncob bodies, but not as much as those with painted eggshell heads. The sturdiest homemade doll was the one made of a clean cornstalk. To make this doll, one peeled off the hard yellow cornstalk exterior, revealing the rigid white pith inside. The head was marked off by biting an indentation about an inch down the stalk and penciling a face on the shorter section. For hair, you could find a wad of sheep's wool snagged on almost any barbed wire fence. It was gray, washed clean from a winter's exposure to sun and snow and was easily fastened to the cornstalk by a small nail. Then also we had real dolls that we, we got at Christmas. I was glad to see the Hacker Creek Road so unchanged. It was along that road that I once gave myself a lesson in self-discipline. When I was a child, my loving and usually practical mother once, once let me pick out a pair of shoes for myself by myself. Mason children always went barefooted joyously as soon and as much as possible, and our unhampered feet widened, so the shoes I selected were too tight, but I thought they were beautiful and knew that when I had worn them long enough, they would stop pinching. Without consulting anybody, I planned how to achieve this quickly. The Hacker Creek Road ran a quarter of a mile beyond our house before it was swallowed up in the deep woods. At the side of this road, midway of the clearing, was a volunteer apple tree, one of those planted unintentionally by some passing bird or animal. My father had let it grow, of course, to see what kind of apple it would be. It might be a brand new variety or one that could be budded or grafted to make a new one. I had often gone to this tree for solitude and comfort. Now I went down to it, put on the tight shoes and laced them up, and decided that if I ran from the tree to the woods and back a certain number of times, ten as I now remember, the shoes would be comfortable. So I did that, and after that the shoes and I were good friends. Naturally, I didn't tell anybody or take any witnesses along for this disciplining project. In the supervisor's yard that October afternoon, the grass was green and neatly mowed. The quince bush was gone. The two big glazed tiles in which every summer, summer my mother planted red cannas and big leafed elephant's ears were gone. Gone was the row of tall golden glows that came up every spring and grew taller than the clumsy, high, unpainted picket fence. My mother planted cosmos by the kitchen window in a grassless spot, nasturtiums and scarlet sage outside the office window, but nobody ever mowed the yard. The backyard was overgrown with long grass. There were bare spots and a cistern in the front yard and near it the wonderful lady in gold peach tree. The cut leaf weeping birch my father planted and protected in winter by fastening burlap around its slim white bark bowl were, was still there in the supervisor's yard, larger now and able to shift for itself. Some small Carolina poplars were their descendants, likely from the row of them that shielded the bare old house from wind on the kitchen side. There was still one evergreen that the orchardist had planted near the cave behind the house. 
the cave had been dug to hold the hundreds of quarts of fruits and vegetables we canned every summer. In rainy weather, the water ran in and made mud on the earthen floor, and we put down boards to walk on. In storms, my mother was always afraid the old house would blow over and made us run to the cave. The cave was gone that afternoon. Gone also was the smokehouse that had been nearby and is memorialized forever in my mind as a place of prayer. Because once when my little sister, Joey, was ill, she suddenly went into a spasm and we thought she was going to die. While my mother bathed her in warm water and rubbed her arms and legs, murmuring, I ran out behind the smokehouse and prayed with all the fervor of a person fighting fire. When I went back in, the spasm over, Joey recovered and grew up to become the editor of a Sunday newspaper magazine in Arizona. Whether my prayers helped as much as Mother's Massage, I never really decided. Many times since then, however, I have occasionally to test the usefulness of prayer in my personal affairs, and I am convinced that although the Lord does not always say yes, He always listens, which may be more than we really deserve, <clears throat> or at least as much as we need. Moreover, I believe the invitation always to pray and not to faint was one of the finest gifts Christ, Christ brought to us, and it ought to be used earnestly and often and in private. You don't have to have a smokehouse. Prayer is an electric cord that carries energy into a receptive appliance. I think my mother may have had a special tenderness for Joey. Anyway, because on the cold February day, the baby was born in a stove-heated upstairs bedroom with a red rug on the floor, Mother suddenly discovered Joey had stopped breathing, and she always said she restored life to her by holding her close and giving her the warmth of Mother's love and body. When Joey was nine years old, she had typhoid, typhoid fever and came near dying. All her hair came out, and we were proud of her because it came back in curly. She had wide, appealing blue eyes and thick, dark lashes, and always had a delicious-sounding laugh. Once, when she was five years old, and my brother James and Nina and I had run off to the woods to play, we took Joey along. Crossing a creek, she slipped on the stone bed and fell, striking her head a severe blow that raised a frightening big welt. We put her bonnet on her head and told her not to take it off under any circumstances. At supper that evening, my mother, who should have been accustomed to the eccentricities of her children, asked mildly, Joey, why don't you take off your bonnet? Joey raised her appealing white eyes to mother and explained candidly, Oh, I can't do that because then you'd see where I hurt my head and they told me not to tell you. Gone by now, obliterated by brush and young trees closing in around it, is the path that led down the steep hill past a towering walnut tree to the little spring from which we carried all of our drinking water. The size of a dishpan, it was dug out of rock, and the water was cold even on the hottest days. On summer nights, we bathed by throwing buckets of cold water on each other, convinced that this would enable us more easily to withstand the coming winter. The little spring water, tested by the State Board of Health, was reported to be pure and of exceptionally good quality. In these days of overmuch spring, I doubt that it would be safe to drink from any spring. From there we could go on down to the woods where, in spring, the hillsides were truly covered with wild flowers. It was a place we liked to explore. There was a big tree that had fallen across the deep creek bed, making an exciting bridge to cross on. From there we could go on up another hill 
and swing on the wide, outspread limbs of big walnut trees. At the top of that hill, a deep gully had eroded under the fence. The fence was completely covered with wild grapevines that bore heavily every year. <clears throat> there was an apple tree at the rim of the gully, self-planted that bore tasty red striped apples and helped hold the soil in place. When we went there to gather apples, we took time to slide down the clay bank of the gully as on a school slide. We called it the grape ditch and enjoyed it and gave no thought to the omnious significance. The soil of that hilly clay area was as subject to erosion as a school child is to measles. A field plowed and left without ground cover soon began to look like the relief maps in our geography books. In summer, the hus huckster came up the Hacker Creek Road. He had a little grocery store on Mahalosville, five or six miles away. He drove two horses to a light wagon, and as soon as he reached the clearing beyond the woods, where the road ran between a peach orchard and a pasture, he began to blow on a horn he carried in the seat with him. By the time he reached the dusty road between the house and the lower barn, we were all there eagerly waiting. Mother sold him eggs and chickens. She bought groceries, and he filled the coal oil can and told the news he had collected along the way. When we got coal oil in town, the grocer had to stick a raw potato on the end of the spout to keep it from spilling on the way home, because of course the cap was always lost. The charm of the huckster's coming was in the old-fashioned pure sugar stick candy he sold. It was peppermint, lemon, vanilla, sassafras, clove, wintergreen in flavor, all meltingly delicious. Mother bought other kinds of candy when she went to town, but it was only from the huckster that we could get that wonderful stick candy. Most of us ate our portions at once, but my sister Nina, who always saved things, took her sticks out and hid them under a loose board in the broken floor of the lower barn and kept them a while. The huckster went on past the house and drove home by the Happy Hollow Road which was the way we went to the mailbox or to town. It went down a steep hill between the banks of woods. In winter, the banks <clears throat> were covered with snow, and on top of the snow, the tall, dark green winter ferns lifted their splendid fronds above the snowy banks like a bouquet set on the cloth of a Thanksgiving dinner table. In every orchard, the orchardist had some little experimental item, something flippant or poetic, or just for curiosity's sake. In the shipper's late red orchard, it was the big mulberry tree at the far side. We went past it in good weather when we took the shortcut to school. I wish the state could have got the Hubbard School in time to preserve it as an example of Indiana's early district schools. There is nothing left now of the one-room, unpainted building, not even the two long stone steps at the door. There were two windows on each side. It never had an enrollment of more than 20 when I knew it, and usually fewer. The teacher was usually a young wo woman a beginner who had just finished a summer's term of preparation. There were a few veterans, though, who went from one school to another in the district, one of them a man who had taught several years there. That was before soft drinks were as common as they are now. Coke was a word found in the geographies and referred only to a kind of fuel. A country pupil whose parents burned only wood might not know this. For that matter, the veteran man teacher might not either. Coke, he exclaimed jovially when asked, Don't you know what Coke is? Why, it's what women put on top of cakes. I've ate a mini a cake with Coke piled high on top of it. 
when the teacher went to the door and shook a small handbell, the pupils came in and sat in their double seats and books took up. There was a 15-minute mid-morning recess, another in mid-afternoon, and an hour's recess at, no at noon. If there were pupils in all eight grades, the teacher taught all the subjects of all eight grades. In my grade, there were two others, a boy and a girl my age, who was my dearest schoolmate. Her name was Mary Shipman, and all her several brothers had genuine drawing talent. All classes to recite got up from their seats and went to the front of the room and sat on the long recitation bench. The teacher had a chair and a small desk in front of the blackboard. One of the coveted special privileges of the Hubbard School was to be sent for a bucket of drinking water in time of books. Two of us went together. We removed the long-handled dipper from the blue and white enameled water bucket sitting on the top of an unoccupied desk among dinner boxes in the back corner of the room. Coats and caps hung from nails driven into the wall in that corner, and over shoes clustered on the floor. The water bringers left the room quietly, and until they were well beyond the playground clearing and out of sight of the schoolhouse and into the woods, spoke only in whispers. Then they laughed talked aloud, killing the luxury of it, and took their time. The water was dipped from a wet weather spring at the foot of a hill in the woods, and I have always remembered with deep pleasure the smell of autumn leaves freshly fallen into it. The school's one room was wide enough for three rows of double desks, but the half of the middle row nearest the teacher's desk was taken up by the flat-topped cast-iron stove that heated the schoolhouse. We parched corn and warmed our wet gloves on its flat top. One cold afternoon, having been fired too vigorously, the stove set the schoolhouse roof afire. Our black and white collie, Robert the Beloved, having forbiddenly followed us to school that morning, saved the day by barking and warning us. We ran out, carried out our books, ran to the Hubbard's house that was close enough for the teacher, usually to room and board with the Hubbard's, and we brought enough water to put the fire out before it did much damage. Within a couple of weeks, we were back again reciting from the long bench. You could, of course, hear every class recite, and by the time a pupil got from first grade through the eighth, he was almost certain to be able to pass the state examination required <clears throat> for receiving a grade school diploma and entering high school. These county examinations were held after the close of the school year in the county seat town for all county pupils. Town pupils did not have to take them. My sister Nina, having finished the sixth, sixth grade, went with an eighth grade friend who was taking the examination. Nina took it, too, to pass the time. She also passed the examination, as she discovered soon after when her grades came, and so went on into high school the following September. Each grade had, <clears throat> had final examinations held at the school. At the end of the term, the state made and printed the questions for these and also provided the blue manuscript books for writing the answers in. We were, were required to write with ink in this book, and that was the only time we wrote with ink during the whole school year. On the first day of school, the room smelled of freshly oiled, bare wood floor, new chalk, new school clothes, new books, and children's lunches. At the end of the term, the teacher made a written report giving the grades of each pupil with recommendations, records of promotions or not promotions, and statistics concerning the amount of time lost by absence or tardiness. Equipment was meager, a box of long white sticks of chalk and a few erasers 
some so worn they squeaked when used on the part of the blackboard that was only black painted wall. The better section of blackboard was slate. There was a stove poker, a shovel, and an ash bucket. No teacher was ever known to use the two framed maps of the hemispheres hanging on the wall between the windows. There were no lamps on the few occasions when we needed light at night, such as when we had box suppers to raise money for a school library. Parents brought coal oil lamps from home. Most pupils were promoted every year. One second grade girl almost got a double promotion one year, not because she was a good reader, but because her father, when he drove the nine miles to town for the regular trading and took occasion to buy her reader, bought her one a grade too far advanced. The teacher let her try it, but gave up exasperated and demoted her when the girl, reading a story read, I was not meant to be children, for hidden always. I loved the Hubbard School, and there in the seventh grade I had one of the best teachers I have ever had. Any place, even in high school or at Indiana University, it was her first school. She was 18 years old and had taken the summer preparatory teaching course at Indiana University that summer. She was so good that when I took the final examination that year, one of the state's questions, what do you think our schools need for improvement, reminded me how fortunate the Hubbard School had been that year, and unhesitatingly, I wrote in my manuscript book, Better Teachers. My answer surprised and wounded the teacher, but fortunately she gave me an opportunity to explain, and it became a good joke between us. It is my basic belief about elementary schools that consolidation is not the answer. The schools should be small, well-equipped, and have superb teachers. Highly paid, expensive, certainly, but all good things are. Peace is expensive. Freedom, the basis of peace, is even more expensive. Life itself is extremely expensive. I did not always have this happy experience with country school teachers. There was one I remembered with anger for years. She taught me in an early grade. My sister Miriam, in an advanced grade, was a favorite with her and received the most flattering attention from her. For some reason, probably natural enough for or I may have been an unlikable child, simply odious to her, she disliked me intensely and habitually made excuses for making me stay in at recess. I was afraid of her and obeyed her. To a country child, the loss of recess is painful and humiliating, especially when there is the rare luxury of, child, of children to play with and exciting games going on outside. Andy over, Barley Bright, Hide and Go Seek, Run Sheepy Run, and in the woods there are grapevines to be cut and looped up into a foothold so one can swing far out across a valley and drop into a pile of dry leaves below. I suffered silently and learned to hate that teacher. I always planned that if I ever saw her again, I would tell her, I hated you then and I hate you now. Years after I did see her, it was at a tea given in my honor after my first book was published, and I did not recognize the teacher when she stood before me. When she identified herself, I could hardly believe it. Now she looked so little, insipid, and harmless. I was taller than she was. Yet when I was little, she had seemed so big, so cruel. She made some complimentary comment, and I thought of what I had so long wanted to tell her, but all I said was, I always thought you liked my sister Miriam, but I never felt you liked me, she said, quickly moving away. Oh, I liked everyone. I do not hate her now, but she had a lasting, damaging effect on me, and because of her I do not make the earnest suggestion that no one should be allowed to teach who does not know the difference between discipline and damage, and that teachers should be as devoted to teaching as ministers are to spreading of the word. 
and farmers are to the preservation of their cherished topsoil. Three of the Eberhard children attended the Hubbard School and the two older boys worked for the orchardist, but our families never exchanged visits. The Eberhard house cowered back against a steep, bare hillside, and the road in front of it was called Mud Lane, because in rainy weather the soft mud came up halfway to the buggy axle. Carl Eberhard, the neighbors said, worshipped the almighty dollar. He probably didn't make many dollars from his scrawny eight-acre farm that was mostly steep hills and low wet fields. It was his ambition to get hold of a good bottom farm in the adjoining county, and he almost did. That was before his oldest son was killed in a quarrel at a country dance, and his second son went to war. All of the Eberhard children were large for their ages. Of the three in school, the middle one was a girl, blonde and not overly bright. She cried when someone pretended to be going to look into her desk, and the children teased her by doing this. The youngest child, a boy, was admittedly dull-witted. Carl was large, sandy-haired, red-faced, and raw-boned, with a perpetual expression of grievance on his face. He worked hard, never went to church or to school, box suppers, never visited any neighbor except on some unpleasant errand like demanding money for livestock damage to his crops. His wife was a frail-looking woman with dark hair, she was pretty and pale. Her timid manner always suggested a rabbit caught and trembling. She must have baked pumpkin pies every day during the school year. The Eberhard children brought big pieces of them in their lunches and ate them at recess and noons, big triangles of brittle white crust with shallow pale filling. The other children teased them, don't drop that on your foot, it'll mash it. An Eberhard baby died one summer. It was 18 months old. My mother and Aunt Rosie, a loving, soft-voiced woman who had large brown eyes and many pretty, bright children, thought it their neighborly duty to go to the funeral. It was a sultry August day, and as they tied the horse to the fence to go into the Ebbard house, my mother said, It's going to storm, Rosie. They were both afraid of storms. The undertaker was already in the house, restlessly waiting, Nobody spoke or greeted anyone else. The people sat around uneasily while the heat increased and the storm clouds gathered darkly in the horizon. Finally, the undertaker asked Carl when the minister would be there. Carl said no minister was coming. The undertaker asked for a Bible so he could read a few verses, and Carl said they had no Bible. Well then, what are we waiting for? cried the undertaker. There's a big storm coming up. We've got to get this over with. They hurried the little casket out to the wagon and started to the Miller Cemetery a few miles farther on toward town. People got into their buggies and followed. They put the casket into the open grave and the undertaker began to throw earth upon it. Oh, this is terrible, Aunt Rosie whispered to my mother. Somebody ought to at least to make a prayer. There was a low mutter of thunder sounding not far away. I will make one myself, said tiny Aunt Rosie, and stepping suddenly forward, she touched the undertaker's arm. Wait, I'm going to pray. He stopped shoveling, waiting, but suddenly all she could remember was the bedtime prayer she had taught all her eight children. She said it, quickly, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Accept this child, O Lord. Amen. Amen, thank you, said the undertaker, and resumed shoveling immediately. A flash of lightning and the first roll of earnest thunder came as the buggies began driving out through the iron gates. And by the time Mother and Aunt Rosie had reached the first lane, where the road went off past Aunt Lou Atkins Farm, the store storm began wrathfully. By the end of World War I, Carl Eberhard had enough money to make the down payment on the good bottom farm he wanted and moved to it. 
but by that time the three older boys were gone and his daughter was married. He had only his frail wife and the youngest boy and himself, and it was not enough. He lost the good farm and had to retreat back to the one at Mud Lane.